The first epistle of Paul the Apostle to Timothy with a word of wisdom from our Father in Jesus' name, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of our God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord, Timothy being Paul's spiritual son, he brought him up in the word and taught him, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went unto Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, no other doctrine but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that means our Father's word, chapter by chapter, word by word, verse by verse, with understanding, with explanation, clarifying what God would have you know through his word. Neither give heed to fables, that's fictitious doctrines, false doctrines that don't line up with our Father's word, and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. So does it make sense or does it bring up questions? Does it cause peace of mind or confusion. That's how you tell the difference. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, love that is to say, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, unwavering, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. That's babble, confusion. They've swerved off the narrow path that you are to stay on, God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, nothing more, nothing less, and they've gone off into a side road on a wild goose chase, which has nothing to do with our Father's Word. This is important, especially in this end generation, that you stay focused and don't allow yourself to be distracted by things that have nothing to do with anything. Things that would confuse people, distract people. You don't want anything to do with that. We've got our Father's Word right here. Is it not good enough for you? Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They don't know what they're talking about because they won't focus on our Father's Word, chapter by chapter. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, kidnappers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine." according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. So the law is good. It's man that's wicked. It's man that follows the imagination of his evil heart and doesn't get into our Father's word and out of love for your heavenly Father, find out what it is God wants you to do, which is to simply love him. And if you loved him, you would study his word and find out what it is he has to say to you. It's his letter to you. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Struck down on the road to Damascus, Paul was, who was before a blasphemer back in those days, and a persecutor, and injurious. Remember in Acts chapter 9, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church and drag them back to Jerusalem to stand trial for preaching the gospel of Christ. But Paul was struck down, and as it's written, he was a chosen vessel, as Christ himself said, to bring forth the gospel on three levels. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was very zealous before and after his conversion. He thought he was in the right. He thought he was doing what was correct according to what he knew of the word of God. He just missed the first advent. He didn't understand that Christ had been born of woman into this second world age, and after his ministry, paid the price for one in all times on the cross, and three days later resurrected. Forty days after the crucifixion, he ascended, and then ten days after that, as we know from the book of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit spake through the apostles, and then you can see the conversion of Paul in Acts chapter 9. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and 
and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the king of sinners, Paul is saying, because of his persecution of the church. He never quite got over it, but he was forgiven for it. He never committed murder. You won't find it written that he murdered anybody, and many people falsely accuse Paul of that, but it's not written. The coats of those who stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7 were put at the feet of Saul, who became Paul later, but he never threw a stone. So make sure you know what you're talking about before you bear false witness, especially against Paul the apostle. You don't want to do that. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. A pattern, a template, an example set forth. Paul being one of God's elect, having no free will, being justified before the foundation of the world. Why? Because God's elect fought against Satan in his first rebellion. And that's why they were chosen before the foundation of the world. And God intervenes in their lives to bring about his will, whether they like it or not. And they're fine with that, having nothing but love for the Father. Otherwise, they wouldn't have fought Satan in the first world age. When Satan deceived a third of God's children, God could have either destroyed a third of his children or created this second world age, this flesh age, a test in which all the souls are born of woman, born innocent of what happened in that first world age to make up his or her mind whether or not they're going to become a Christian, which is the only way to the Father, and return to the Father, as opposed to going into that lake of fire at the end of the thousand years. That's when that happens at the great white throne judgment. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto the son, Timothy, his son in the faith, not biologically, but he was brought up, he was converted by Paul, and you can read of that in the book of Acts as well. According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places, as Paul wrote in Ephesians. As it was written through Paul, I should say, he was just a chosen vessel, as we said before, as it is written in the book of Acts, chapter 9. Holding faith and a good conscience, with some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. They crashed right into the rocks, going off that narrow path. And as Christ said, narrow is the way, and there are few that find it. Broad is the path to destruction. So you want to stay focused on your Father's word and don't deviate from that path. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's all he could do. They wouldn't listen, obviously. Chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. There you have it right there. Christ brings about peace of mind, not confusion. Satan's the author of confusion that brings about insanity with his false doctrine and his crazy distractions that people get wrapped up in. That's a good way to veer off course and wreck your Christian ship. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. It's not his will that any should perish, but all come to repentance and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, the only way to the Father, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, paying the price for one and all times, whereby your sins are erased upon repentance. Once you convert to Christianity, if you transgress God's law, and you're going to, that's what it is to sin, is to transgress God's law. So first of all, you want to become familiar with it, the law of God, that is to say, that we were speaking of earlier. And whenever you fall short, which you're going to do because you're human, then you just apologize, you repent for it, and then it's erased if you're sincere. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, one sent forth, that is to say, 
I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles, the nations, those not of the natural seed of Israel, but all are one in Christ Jesus, as it's written in Galatians chapter 3. In faith and verity, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, but with faith unwavering. And now let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 again. What we're talking about here is focusing on the Word of God and being strict with yourself about it. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. It's getting closer and closer to that five-month-long hour of temptation, and you want to stay focused because Satan will appear as the false Christ in the middle of that five-month-long hour of temptation, and you want to be ready because... He is a deceiver of deceivers, as you should know as a student of your Father's Word. And you don't want to be ignorant of his devices, even now, because it's already in the world. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. So Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's speaking spiritually, the destruction of your soul. And many there be which go in thereat, because they won't stay focused. They won't get into their Father's Word and understand what it is God would warn you about if you would listen and not be deceived, not receive that mark of the beast in your forehead whenever Satan appears at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial, but rather have the seal of God in your forehead, in your mind. What's in your forehead? Your brain. What's in your brain? Is it the Word of God? Is it God's warnings? Do you know the chronological order of events which must first transpire before the true Christ returns? All are changed into spiritual bodies at the seventh trumpet, which is when the true Christ returns. That's how you'll know the difference. And if that's not enough for you, God said over and over and over again, whether it be through a type or point blank, as it is in the book of Revelation, that the false Christ is Satan himself, and he's going to appear at the sixth trumpet, the sixth vial, and the sixth seal, that's 666, and you're either going to receive at that time the mark of the beast in your forehead, which is the deception, or you already have the seal of God in your forehead, which is the truth of God's word, whereby you're not deceived. That's the narrow way, as you see in the next verse. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, eternal life, of course, and few there be that find it. Few there be that take the time to sit down and focus on their Father's word.